Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Malay Heritage Centre. And uh, good afternoon to you watching from home. Um, today we are here for a forum uh, as part of our public lecture series, uh, Growing Up Banja in Singapore, the Banjaris families of Minto Road, Jalan Pisang, and other areas. Uh, this, this forum is organised in conjunction with our ongoing special exhibition, uh, Orang Banja, uh, Heritage and Culture of the Banja in Singapore, which will run on, until 25th July uh, 2021. Um, joining me today, uh, to my left, uh, Dr. Effendi Abdul Hamid, uh, from Department of Southeast Asian Studies, NUS, um, Cikgu Ghazali Arshad, uh, who is a second generation Banja, uh, who grew up in Lorong Malikan, uh, he's a retired teacher and he also acts as an uh, advisor to the Banja Community Organization. Um, to my right, uh, two sisters, uh, Falida and Fauzia, uh, Jamal, uh, second generation Banja as well. Uh, their father was a diamond trader and uh, they grew up in uh, apa ni? Jalan Pisang, just behind here. And uh, up, yeah, Jalan Pisang, which is an area associated with the Banja community in Singapore. Okay, so this uh, series, uh, Orang Banja, is part of a larger series. Uh, it, uh, this exhibition is part of a larger series, Senu Santara, uh, which MHC has been working with. Uh, the uh, community organizations such as the Bayanese community, the Minangkabau community, uh, the Javanese, as well as the Bugis. So this is the fifth uh, exhibition as part of the Senu Santara series, and we hope to continue further uh, with other smaller groups. Um, so, I just want to share uh, a bit of context as to the background of the Senu Santara series uh, and also the research phase of coming up with this particular exhibition. Um, as with the other groups, uh, throughout the research phase, uh, we found uh, our greatest challenge is the availability of uh, research materials done on the community in Singapore. Um, either in the forms of academic journals, uh, past studies, whether professional or even amateur research, uh, it's very hard to come by. Uh, yeah, and so a lot of the information that we have gathered uh, actually, uh, and we've also included in our exhibition and also part of our programs, is uh, put together from first time experiences of people who identify as Banjas themselves. Um, so, listening, we've been going to their homes, you know, uh, imposing ourselves on their schedules and weekends, uh, looking through their family albums, listening to their family stories. Uh, yeah, picking through their objects at home and all that. Uh, yeah, macam penyamun kadang-kadang. Sometimes it feels like we're going there and stealing your things for a few months. Um, so these are all first time research being done on the Banja community. And um, piecing all this information and materials together to come up with a cohesive narrative uh, has been very trying, but we're very thankful to the Banja community representatives who are always willing to share more of their stories with us. Um, so, what we have gathered uh, depended a lot on the memories of individuals uh, who are still with us. So one of the things that we regret that we couldn't get is um, some individuals who would have certain very interesting stories who are from the Banja communities, sadly are no longer with us and we cannot ever perhaps document those, those stories. So it is quite an urgent task, I think, to document uh, the history of the various communities in Singapore. Anyway, while it has been a very interesting and trying journey, uh, I think likewise for you guys as well, uh, the community representatives, um, the work to document the history needs to continue, and I hope our academic friends uh, would take on this huge task, uh, inshallah, and also encourage your, your students, your future academics and leaders of the world to look into some of these things, these gaps. Right? All right. Um, originally, this uh, forum, Growing Up Banjaris in, in Singapore, included Dr. Imran Tajuddin uh, because we wanted to talk about where the Banjaris lived. Uh, so, what properties did they own, where their kampongs were and all that. Because today, we, we don't know mana kampung Banja tu. Ada tak nama kampung Banja. Uh, it's not uh, popularly known. It, you have to be a, a historian, a researcher to look and know some of these things. So, uh, Dr. Imran was supposed to join us and share a bit about that. Uh, another person he, who was supposed to be with us is uh, Encik Rosli, who grew up on Minto Road. Uh, sadly, Dr. Imran had a scheduling issue, and Encik Rosli's mother was taken ill a few days ago, so he had to drop out. Encik uh, Gum, uh, can you look away from the camera? Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, like I was saying, cik, cikgu yang duduk tengah. Lagi. Terima kasih. Okay. Um, like I was saying, Cik Rosli, uh, Cik Rosli's mother was taken ill a few days ago, so um, our best wishes to him and his family in this trying time. Anyway, despite the setbacks, I thank you, uh, Dr. Fendi and Ghazali, for joining us to share your bits with us. Um, so, like I said, it was intended to look at um, certain aspects of Banjari's culture and also to answer some of the questions we still have, despite these past few months of talking to the community. Because the community groups um, would remember uh, details from their own families, from their own history, and that goes back maybe one or two generations. Um, but the history of the Banjar in Singapore perhaps goes back a bit longer. And, and those memories we don't really have. And, uh, so it's not really the task of the community to uh, really look into this research. I think it's the task of professionals like you uh, to make you a bit gatal and find out more. Right? Um, so the difference about the Banjar, I think the specialty about the Banjar in Singapore, in particular in comparison to the Javanese, the, the Bawianese, the Bugis, uh, is that they're very small in numbers. Uh, there's very few Banjaris in Singapore. Um, and because of their small numbers, they don't really have the numbers to open a kampong. You know, a, a group of Javanese migrants would come in one wave and then open kampongs. The Banjars didn't really have those numbers. So they had to live in mixed kampongs, mingling with people uh, not of Banjaris descent. Right? So to this end, uh, we were hoping that Dr. Imran would share some of these insights on Banjar owned properties as well as the various kampongs. Um, Dr. Imran actually admitted to me, he also, when I spoke to him about this, whether we could come out with a program, he said he never do research at all on the Banja. Well, now he has. Lah. So hopefully we can get him at another date. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Effendi, for taking the slot. But Dr. Effendi is a historian. Uh, he will not be responding to the same questions that uh, Dr. Imran was supposed to. He will be responding to other questions. And Dr. Effendi, who is also a secret Banja, He's Banjaris, but he doesn't want any of you to know. Because he's wearing Jawa. He's not declared. He's not declared. When I spoke to him about about the uh, coming on board uh, for these pro, uh, programs, he also said he has not done any research on the Banjaris as well. And now you also have. So thank you very much. Uh, anyway. Uh, there are a few things that we know for certain about the Banjaris in Singapore, and we hope to unpack some of these things. Uh, one thing we know for certain is there are a small number of Banjaris in Singapore. Um, even in 19th century British census, uh, it has stated that the Banjar's numbers are minuscule compared to the Bawianis, Minangkabau, Javanese, and Bugis. Um, so how can we explain uh, why there's so little Banjaris migration into Singapore uh, in the 19th and 20th, 20th centuries. So we hope Dr. Fendi can uh, answer some of those questions. Another thing we do know is um, a lot of the Banjaris in Singapore are known to be diamond traders. Um, but cannot everyone come here as a diamond trader, right? So some people, what, what other trades perhaps uh, were they involved in? Right? So we were hoping that the community uh, representatives could share a bit uh, from, from their own family uh, background um, who are your family members who perhaps were not diamond traders, but uh, you know, perhaps uh, venture into other areas, other professions. Right? Um, okay, before we start, uh, just some housekeeping rules. Uh, we will not be, you, if you have questions, keep it to the end, uh, and do not shout your questions out loud. It's still COVID-19. Um, there are two things we cannot do. We cannot let you ask your question out loud. We cannot give you microphones. Because right? if I give you a microphone, I have to sterilize the microphone, put it half an hour, then wait for next question. So, um, <coughs> this is what we're going to do instead. Are you alive? Hello, hello? Hmm. Oh no, did my clicker die? Ah, okay. So, if you have questions, uh, this is a QR code. Uh, please scan it, uh, post your questions on, on the platform. I will receive it on my cell phone and I will read it, right? Uh, so try to keep your questions uh, specific to the context of what is being discussed uh, as much as possible. Uh, if your questions are not questions, I will not read them. Right? Uh, if they are comments or things to correct, we will take note, but we will, not, uh, we will uh, prioritize the questions for responses. Right? Um, the next housekeeping is for the speakers. Each speaker, you have about half an hour to talk. Right? Uh, at the 20 minute mark, I will do this. That means you have 10 more minutes. At 25, two bells. 
Right? That means you have five more minutes, so you should start wrapping up. If you hear this, means you I will mute you in the next second. So, uh, yeah. While I understand that, you know, the, the <coughs> desire to share a lot more of your history, it could be quite uh, fun, but try to keep it within the timing. Eh? Uh, maybe we can have more during the Q&A. Okay, to kick off the forum, we have Dr. Effendi Abdul Hamid. Um, he will be setting the historical context of why and how the Banjas came to Singapore and how their migration or lack thereof is directly linked to the diamond trade, so lucrative to both the British and the Dutch. Uh, Dr. Effendi is a lecturer of the Department of Southeast Asia Studies uh, in NUS. He is a historian of Southeast Asia and his research interests include the study of the, the Chams, the Champa, and of uh, Southeast Asian martial arts, of which I understand he's been spending many painful months working on this project. I'm looking forward. Yes! Okay, I look forward to seeing it. Okay. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Fendi, please. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. It is such a pleasure uh, to share whatever I have with MHC. Uh, for the activities. Yeah, these guys are very important and I'm really happy that you know, um, I'm going to share something with you all about the Banja. Now, my presentation is um, entitled Insights from 19th Century British Sources on the Diamonds of Borneo. Um, this is quite a very under-researched topic. We do have sources about um, what the Dutch you know, did and how they engaged local rulers, especially in Borneo to get access to diamond mines and rivers that contain diamonds, but there has been very little research on the British interests on similar things. But, you know, uh, fortunately, I've uh, found some stuff which could be of interest for our conversation today about the Banjar, uh, the importance of the Banjar community in Singapore and especially in the diamond trade and production in the 19th to early 20th centuries. A little bit of context. Um, the Dutch and British were rivals. All right? They were great power rivals, and they do not want to have any conflict um, too much. And this whole issue of Singapore all right, was really a, a testing, a very testing matter to the Dutch and the British. Uh, 1819 was the funding of Singapore. So the Anglo-Dutch Treaty, 1824, was designed to solve some of the problems about British and Dutch spheres of influence. It did, uh, it did solve some problems, but of course, you know, once you arbitrarily put lines of, um, where they indicate your spheres of influence, there will be surely you know, problems as well. But these problems are of territoriality, power, influence, was managed carefully and easily by the Anglo-Dutch Treaty of 1824. This is very, very important because this treaty split the, uh, the, the Dutch and English halves in Southeast Asia. This also minimized conflict. Now, when this happened, the British were able to focus their operations, commercial activities in Singapore. This is very, very important. From Singapore, they managed to extend their influence all over Southeast Asia, particularly in Burma and the Malayan Peninsula. But we do know as well that the British, with the uh, establishment of Singapore, uh, did uh, cater a lot to the Bugis traders that came to Singapore during the Bugis season uh, during the 1830s and 50s. So the Bugis did profit a lot from the Bugis traders during that time. But we do not know much about the other communities that the British engaged and um, made money with. Right? One easy assumption to make is that it is the British surely could have established connections with the Banjaris community in Singapore and even in Borneo to get access to the diamond trade and production. But surprisingly, it was not you know, clear in the sources whether this was done much at all. But I have fortunately found some sources um, from the British side, um, three types of sources. John Layden's Sketch of Borneo, published in 1814, he died in 1811. He is an early researcher of Southeast Asia, to me at least, and he wrote about how the British perceived the diamond and trade production of Borneo and the Banja Kingdom in the 19th century. The second source is J. Small's Notices from Indian Archipelago and Asian Countries, published in 18, 1837. This is another interesting source because you know, he indicates 
um, growing British interests, and they know a lot about how mining operations were done in Borneo and the specific communities that operated. Then the third type of source is the various colonial era reportage uh, from the miners themselves, British, you know, who went to Borneo, owned some concessions or diamond areas and mined them, and they wrote reports about their activities and which they wrote for the Singapore early presses. So this is the three types of sources which I will mention briefly um, in this talk here. And lastly, I will hypothesize based on the information from the sources about why there was so little Banja migration to Singapore in the 19th to early 20th centuries. And I think the, the, the factors may or may not surprise you. Now, first of all, from the latent source is that, you know, um, the British knew much about the diamond trade and various mines in Borneo. They have very detailed descriptions of the various ethnic communities. Now, for the British, ethnic mapping is very important. Communities need to be identified, which were the useful ones, which were the dangerous ones, even the useless ones. They need ethnic mapping. This is what they did in Singapore. This is what they did in Malaya. Problem is this. When, they, when the British got to know more about um, the diamond trade and production of Borneo itself, they noticed one thing. Many of the local rulers were under the control of the Dutch. They had, the Dutch I mean, had established a very, very old system of agreements with local rulers. These are very hard to penetrate. But again, British interests, despite these um, challenges, did not evaporate. In fact, more and more reports were written about the Borneo diamond and trade production in the 19th century. They noticed that Bajamasin, south side of island Borneo, was the most powerful state, and they most importantly noticed this immediately, that the population of Banjarmasin, in the, even in the late 18th century, was very small. It was even mixed, all right? So this small concentration of uh, population in the, king, in the state of uh, Banjarmasin is something to regard, yeah? Because when you have small populations, it would reduce the kinds of um, uh, numbers of migration to Singapore. This is a very important factor. And also what they notice as well in Leiden's um, uh, source is that even in the small towns around Bajamasin, there is the even smaller populations. And the majority of the population in these areas are formed by the Dayaks. But again, the British were interested in the diamond production and trade, so they immediately say that, yeah, this place, even though very small populations, diamonds are worth it. If we were to invest in these areas, we want this mineral. So to make a little bit of sense here, the British were very much interested in these areas here. This area here, where the very old mines of uh, Landa were located, and the British were also interested in these areas here. Now, uh, near central and south Kalimantan, also uh, diamond-bearing areas as well as gold. So these are the two areas which the British reported about. The Anglo-Dutch Treaty split this area, these areas here into two halves, yeah? British on this side and the Dutch all over what is now Indo modern Indonesia. Now diamonds, how the British described it, how they were produced, very, very interesting. They, there was a lot of detailed knowledge. They described mining operations by the Banjaris, by other communities with very, very good detail. Miners in um, Pontiana, even Bajamasin, were led by a person titled Malim. Now, once diamonds were dug out of the ground, the sultan of the rulers around the area would claim all diamonds above five carats. Smart, huh? And the most interesting story that the British often repeat over and over again in this kind of sources that I found is the legendary Matan diamond of the Matan king, discovered in Landa. It is 367 carats. Um, I think it's the size of a walnut, right, or my hand. Right? It's, it's very big, huh? I'm not too sure. The expert last week will be, uh, will be te we can tell uh, more about this. But it is very interesting how this Matan diamond, 367 carats, was a sort of a British obsession. They keep, telling, they keep telling about it, writing about it in these sources. And this, this British source uh, by Leiden uh, mentioned that, you know, the, once the Dutch heard about it, this Dutch official named Mr. Sudvat and the Sultan of Pontiana went to see the ruler of Matan and offered that amount 
plus two warships and ammo, but was still refused. Um, yeah, so why it was refused? Because that diamond had miraculous healing powers. That was the stuff that I found from the Leyden source of 1814. The next source I'm going to talk about is J.H. Moore's notices from the Indian archipelago and adjacent countries in 1837. Now, J.H. Moore is an editor um, of the Singapore Chronicle uh, in Singapore, and he, has, uh, he did produce something for, of, for our interests and discussion today. Um, he compiled a lot of reportage from Borneo itself, especially from the concession, British concession owners, and they have a lot of things to tell about operations um, there. There are many reports. First thing that the British reported about Borneo is that it had great trade connections with a lot of other places around <coughs> Southeast Asia, like such as China, Sulu, Philippines, Straits of Malacca, and Eastern Malaya. And Borneo was also much interest, uh, of great interest by Chinese traders from parts of China. And it, these, these connections were all very, very attractive for the British because they can amplify trade with Singapore. Singapore trade with Borneo is also something for us to think about. It is very good as well. 1824, 40 parahos. I do not know what size. Parahos could also mean ships, all right? went to Singapore from various uh, parts of Borneo. The Borneoans had, uh, according to the British, liked the British, and they even helped uh, the British at one point of time in history. So all these good connections made the British thought that ports like, uh, if they establish a port in Labuan, it will be as successful as Singapore, a second Singapore. And, and this port in Labuan can allow the British to access the China, Siamese, Cambodian, and Vietnamese trade. Labuan, in other words, can be the British port of the east, while Singapore to the west of Southeast Asia. Now, that report as well by J.H. Moore, that source, also tells us that the British are still very much, even in 1837, very interested in the diamond mines of Landak. Landak was famous for diamonds, gold, and iron, um, not too far away from Singapore, just five-day voyage. And the diamonds, how the British describe it in that river, Landa, or area of mining, were, were yellow. Right? The diamonds were yellow. They were found at different depths. And locals had to dig until they, what they call the Amper Strata. I'm not too sure what this is. And this is where the miners found the diamond veins, uh, where lots of diamonds were located. So Landa is here. I know it's too small, all right? Landa is around here, right? And these are, this is very... Uh, in, very interesting to the British. They need to understand where these important areas, important resources are located. Now, what, but what they uh, also describe the British is that these operations by locals are rather primitive. How, even though they were primitive, the locals still dig up a lot of diamonds, even with such primitive me methods. Simple operations, you dig a huge hole in the ground, especially on a riverbed which contains black clay, that is the spot where diamonds are usually found, and they take this black clay and wash it at a nearby river, and voila, you find diamonds quite easily. So the British in this report were saying, what if we go there with proper machinery, proper expertise, and dig up more diamonds than them? This is what they wanted to do. So the largest diamond was found in these mines by primitive methods were 36 carats. But also at the same time, even if the British were interested in the diamond mines of Landak, um, they also observed how the Dutch and locals controlled the diamond trade and production in that area. All right? And uh, quite a lengthy description here, but I will sum it up. If a local finds a diamond in such an area, these stones are delivered to the government, the Dutch government, right, in Batavia at 20% below market price. Get them cheap. Dutch got them cheap. The best ones, the large ones, were sent to Batavia. Profits divided between the Dutch and local rulers. This is how they work. This is how the Dutch really um, be benefited from the diamond trade and production, and this is what the British really observed. Did, they, did the British try to break Dutch monopoly? Yes, they did. They were attempts, but rather weak attempts. Why? Because, again, they do not want to go 
uh, they do not want any conflict with the Dutch authorities. But they did try to siphon off some trade that was going on in Borneo, and which is why the Singapore-British trade in Borneo took place between Tanung, Tanung Batu and north of Borneo, centralized in that area, and they had connections with you know, locals there. And the Dutch were also very smart. They imposed high duties, 35% duty on British-made goods in Borneo, so it makes the British-produced goods, uh, which, they tried, which they traded with the locals, very high price. So it's very much a disincentive. In other words, the Dutch tried to make uh, it very hard for local traders to trade with the British. They tried all the time to persuade the locals in Borneo um, to trade in the ports of Samarang and Grise. But again, local traders were still very much for Singapore. So this is what the sources tell us. The last source that I'm going to talk about gives us a very, very uh, good clue about why there were very little uh, Banja migration to Singapore. All right? um, this particular report, which I found in the Singapore Free Press and Mercantile Advertiser, contains an 1890 report on the mining industries in the Far East. Now, this is very in interesting because it summed up how the British thought about the diamond trade, how they first engaged it, and what happened then. It all started in 1887, when quartz from Sambas were, brought, were bought by Mr. Didlow from Singapore. Right? In Singapore, these quartz were very high quality, and this, this, is, uh, this news fled among the British mercantile community in Singapore, and all of them wanted to have concessions in Western Borneo. Somehow, word got out that diamonds can be uh, accessed somehow. So what happened next in this report was that two mining experts were sent to Sambas to inspect the concessions. And in 1888, concessions were granted by the Sultan of Sambas to Mr. Lidlow and Gordon. And uh, Sambas Exploration Company was formed. Now, this is very, very important. They were the, among the first to be British companies British uh, uh, concession holders to be in Borneo. And what happened next was production. Results were good. Diamonds were found, and more concessions were bought in Mando, Landa, Tajan, Sangau, Muliao, so on and so forth in Borneo. So this is very, very important. With these concessions bought by the British, you have more British presence in Borneo. They bought the concessions to be, to mine in, um, in the area. With the increase in British presence, with the British buying up concessions from Borneo, uh, the right to mine uh, for diamonds in that area, you increase demand for diamond cutters. Because the diamond's true value only begins when you polish it up, when you make it glistening, bright. This is what was uh, in the British mines. You, it is not enough just to dig it up. You need to polish it, you need to market it, you need to really negotiate high prices with it. So this is why, the, with the increase in British concessions, you increase demand for diamond cutters, not diamond traders. This is something very interesting that are, are for future research. So what it says in this report was that there was a great trade of diamonds in, in, in Pontiana. Lots of diamonds flowed uh, due to British concession work um, in, in the production of finding these diamonds, and all of them flowed to Pontiana and hundreds of men were hired to cut and polish diamonds, not only from Borneo, but also from South Africa, with Cape Diamonds. They were, apparently, what this source tells us is that these guys are so good, these diamond cutters were so good, that they handled other diamonds from around the world. And in 1941, somehow, the British wrote about, uh, uh, about pre-World War II diamond cutting work of the Banjaris in Singapore. Now, if you have time, just look up this source, and what it tells us is something very interesting. This trade, this art of diamond cutting is very complex. A lot of, some, the, the stone wheels are not new. These are very old. So it, it suggests to me that these skills are passed from father to son to generations, and something happened in Singapore's history um, that, that the knowledge was not passed down. This is a great mystery to me, so I hope maybe we can have a conversation after this. But why this important knowledge of diamond cutting was not passed down, even though they got all the tools? So we have from this newspaper very old pictures of Banja stone cutters in 1941, pre-war period. Quite amazing. Diamond cutters moved to Singapore in 1889. Now, there are three main reasons for this. Uh, 
there was a decline in production of diamonds from West Borneo, Dutch West Borneo, because of a great rainfall, which happened from 1888 to 1890. So all the cutters were not able to go to work, so they were transferred to Singapore. Second reason why they moved to Singapore was that access to diamonds somehow for these diamond cutters stopped. The report mentioned that this is due to the rivalry between Europeans, the British, and local miners who do not like them. So why should I help you? Why should I give you your, the diamonds? Right? Because, yeah, so bye. So they were transferred to Singapore, the diamond cutters, because of lack of work. But the main reason was the was for the transfer of Singapore was the fall of prices of rough diamonds in the 19th century world trade. All right? This is due to the opening up and discovery of diamonds in South Africa. All right? So this led to the Banjara diamonds in Borneo, and Pontiana being uh, falling behind in production. So these diamond cutters with no work were sent to Singapore to even cut the, the Cape diamonds. Right? So in conclusion, what the sources tell us are many. But again, uh, caveat is that this is very early in pre preliminary research. I need to do more stuff. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So what the sources tell us is that the British were very interested in the diamond operations and trade in Borneo, especially in Landa and Pontiana, but the Dutch had already established a strong presence there, all right, since the 17th and 18th century. They had agreements with local rulers. But, uh, but uh, the, now, we also know from the sources is that um, the Dutch really wanted to control these diamond sources and production and the best diamonds go to Batavia. They really wanted to ensure that flow to Batavia, not to Singapore. And of course, you know, the British tried to control the diamond trade and production in Borneo by owning concessions, but you know, the decline in diamond prices, bad weather, and, and resistance from local miners minimized their success. And uh, these are the sources. If you want to take a look at them, go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Thank you, Dr. Fendi. Uh, yeah, you helped set the context for British interest in Banjar Diamond. Uh, some, some of the conversations we had uh, when we met before the, the exhibition was launched was, what is the nature of uh, the, the trade? How did it look? What does it look like? Because right? there's, uh, there's no shops. Uh, yeah, but there, there seems to be a gap. Like. You have to go as far back to 1890 to find source about the diamond trade and I think we don't really have as much idea of how that trade was uh, pre and post World War II. So yeah, I think we need to look into some of these things. And yeah, I hook you up with the legacy families. Yeah. Okay, thank you Dr. Fendi. Um, next we have Cikgu Ghazali. Uh, Cikgu Ghazali grew up in Lorong Malikan, uh, that's in Kembangan. Um, Interestingly, his, his family kept a salasila, uh, the, a family tree, which is on display in our special exhibition, and also a model of his house at 45 Lorong Malikan. Uh, yeah, it is also part of the special exhibition. Uh, sadly, of course, perhaps that house is not there anymore, eh, Cikgu? Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, so to share a bit about his childhood and how um, he grew up in Lorong Malikan, um, what that childhood was like and uh, the kind of trades and business and activities that went on around uh, the Banja communities in Lorong Malikan. Cikgu, silakan. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, firstly, I must thank uh, Malay Heritage Center for inviting me uh, to share uh, my experience growing up uh, in Lower American. In fact, uh, Thank you uh, also to Mr. Jamal for sorting my name in, in place of making place from uh, Mr. Rosli. Eh? Okay, um, before I proceed, uh, this is uh, the house model of Long American. 
Take a good look at it. Okay. Uh, I built this model, uh, this house model, uh, entirely based on uh, my childhood memories uh, living in Lower American. Uh, this is just a uh, to show the uh, house models, show a simple rumah panggung. Uh, and this rumah panggung has a lot of memories, special memories for us, our family. Okay? Alright. Now, before my father and his younger brother, my father, Mom Ashad, and his younger brother, Hajusin, moved to Low American, uh, the, their first house was at Kampung Java Road. For, they lived in Kampung Java Road for several years and somehow they feel that they like to move to another suburban area and looking for rumah panggung. And finally they found this, this house, 45 Lower Marikan, and my uncle's house is just at the back of, the, uh, of this house. You can see the house model of my uncle's house at the gallery too also. Okay. Okay. Then I think uh, before I talk about this house and then uh, my growing up uh, in American, I think I have, uh, let's see at this uh, family tree, or Salsila. Now, this is the Salisila or family tree of Haji Mahmud. Haji Mahmud is my grandfather. Haji Mahmud bin Abdul Rahim. Okay? Now, can you understand the, how, how the, 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 the military, uh, what is actually the two, one, two, three, what is that? Three wives. <laughs> three wives. <laughs> So he married. He came to Singapore in 1880, settled down, and he has three wives. Married three wives. The first wife has uh, first ones on the behind. Okay. Ah, uh, that was first wife has three children. Yeah. The second wife is the at the end, the other end. They have uh, nine children, and the third wife, four children. The third wife is my father's mother. Okay. So the, the middle one is is a family tree of my family tree. See, my father, his younger brother Haji Hussein, Haji Sanusi, and Haji Jamila. Okay, now, uh, we just heard from the Safani about uh, how, about diamonds. I, it's only that I was sitting there, uh, I couldn't really uh, record or something, I must see him afterwards. <laughs> so I'm, I'm getting interested in it, because my grandfather, he uh, he's quite a successful diamond trader. Yeah, one of the successful Diamond drivers came from Banja Madhupura. Okay, but uh, unfortunately, the skill of uh, cutting diamond, the uh, manchana in time, uh, doesn't bring down to the, did not bring to the, the children. Except and maybe one or two brothers of mine, they did know how, how to manchana in time, but the rest, okay, uh, they maybe they were not interested in. That trade, eh? <laughs> I don't know. Eh? All right. Uh, so, uh, Haji Mahmud has altogether 16 children. All right? Uh, and you see the, the yellow uh, below the, uh, the, the yellow one is the, 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 the grandson, the, great, the grandchildren. Children. Yeah, so uh, 
during the when we completed this uh, family tree, there were about uh, 71 grandchildren. And that great grandchildren, about 268 at that, <laughs> when we completed uh, the, the family tree. And then, uh, my father's younger, uh, third, uh, second brother is uh, Haji Hussein, and the third brother is, was Haji uh, Sanusi. Haji Sanusi is, was the first uh, Mufti of Singapore. Okay. In fact, uh, my father and, and their siblings, or the, the sons, eh, they were educated in English, you know. And Haji Hussein, in fact, was an English teacher. He, he ever taught at uh, Madras Al Marif English. Okay? And Haji Sanusi is a uh, success. He, is, he, has, uh, his, he, he went to secular schools, but when he met one of the ulama uh, from uh, in the Uguri, Ramadan Siddiq, and suddenly he made a 360 degree turn, he became interested in pursuing his studies in Islam. Okay? And in fact, he did very well in the, his secular subjects. He, did, he, he got very good grade and, and he could easily pursue to the higher institution in, in, in the secular, secular subjects. Yeah? But then he changed his mind. That, then he went to Mecca. From Mecca, he was accepted to study at Azhar University. Okay? When he came back, he was the first person who got MA degree in, from Azhar University, Cairo. So MA is Alamia I got for, for, for this... Uh, uh, degree from Cairo, Azhar Cairo. Okay? Uh, so, okay, let's go back to our, our focus on uh, my house in Lower American. So when um, my father and his brother, younger brother, uh, moved into America, they finally found a house in Lower American and they bought, they bought the house in Lower American. But uh, at that time, they, I think they moved in to, in 1938, I wasn't born at the time. Eh? 98. And the only thing, the drawback about American is, is the uh, area, the, the, it's not uh, uh, properly, they don't have the pro proper drainage system. So much so that when it rains during the rainy day, most of the area in Lower will be flooded. And you know what happened? The boys. The boys, including myself, eh, we really enjoy playing in the rain. We are not, and the only part is that, was that we never got sick. Never got to school, and could, it could be our body must have uh, developed an immune system so that we are going to get sick. Okay? And they are not afraid of rain. And of course, their parents will be worried. But they are not worried about themselves. Because they, are not, they never got sick. You just think, uh, you just, if you to compare our, the children, our children, uh, yeah? In fact, in those days, the boys are more close to nature. Okay? I was, I was really far from nature. They are so absorbed in the, the handphones and sometimes, so I don't know what to happen. <laughs> so it may be good or bad. I, it, there are advantages and disadvantages of, 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 uh, of this kind of, uh, you know, uh, 
we made it. So anyway, we have to, as parents, we have to be careful also. We have to, you know, uh, make sure that they don't uh, play with handphone, you know, every day, every, every time they like to, you to, to watch and at least have, uh, to, have to set, say, one or two hours and then after that, I have to stop. Okay? Okay. Then, uh, get back to Lord Marikan at night time. After the rain, and you know what happened? After then, the, we will look for fighting fish. Fighting fish. And you know what happened? We keep the fish in the bottle, and it is just like an entertainment. No? We let the fish, we put one fish to another bottle where there's another other fish, then this fish is fight. In fact, this fighting fish at the end time, it was uh, even the, 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 the adults. There's this uh, kind of game eh? uh, for gambling. Eh? For gambling. Yeah? So, but for us, it's just an entertainment, although it's quite cruel. Yeah. Okay, then uh, staying in Lomarikan, uh, there are so many kinds of games, you know. Sometimes at a certain season, they'll play the fly kite. Another time, they play tops, gassing, eh? and marbles. Okay, but the sweet memory about staying in that in, in Lord American is that at night, at a certain season, we, the boys, will chase fireflies. Fireflies, huh? And some of our ones will take the fireflies and cut open to see whether there's any lights in the, in the, in the body. See? Um. Again? Cepat sikit, okay. We need <laughs> okay, then um, after that, uh, the only uh, uh, memory that I would like, I would like to, to, to forget is the, the toilets. <laughs> the toilets were built outside the house, and you just imagine at night, you have, you have to go to the toilet, in the middle of the night, it'd be scary. That'd be a problem. Eh? Of course, uh, the American, as time goes by, uh, Things have improved. The rooms are better. The system um, is a good system. Yeah. And then. Can I interrupt? Uh, can you share more about who your neighbors were, how you guys identified yeah, Banja, and how that. Yeah, Yeah, because. Okay. We're, Time, eh? Ah. Okay. All right. Then, uh, everyone, knows, everyone knows that uh, uh, Banja is the smallest uh, sub ethnic group. But. In Loro American, you know, uh, my father and my uncle, they were well known. Because somehow, some of the seniors from other ethnic group, they came to know that uh, my father and his brother and Ajit Sanusi were the descendants, descendants of uh, one of the famous ulama in uh, Banja Madhupura, Haji Marshal Banja. Aji Habran Siddiq. Okay. Then, then from then on, they have more respect on, the, on my, my father and my uncle. And my uncle has a busy conducting religious classes. My uncle, uh, my father, has become the chosen man for, for the uh, the Malays to have, uh, you know, like Kenduri, Tahlil, Baca Tahlil, that my father will be the one to read, to re leading, uh, reciting uh, to us uh, in that uh, religious function. Okay? So, although uh, Banjam is, among, uh, is the smallest uh, uh, It's the smallest uh, group, 
uh, ethnic group in among, among the uh, ethnic group, but they played important role, prominent role in the life of people in Lower American. Okay, uh, they may be minor in, uh, the, minor, the minorities, but in fact, most of the people from other ethnic groups like Javanese, Boyanese, uh, Bukis, they look up on Haji Baba Ashad, Naju Sin, and Sanusi. Especially, Sanusi, they know that Sanusi uh, learns uh, study in Cairo. Yeah. Okay. All right. Then uh, my father, uh, uh, to my relatives, he was, he was just like, like uh, you know, the the Boyanese they have this part Lora, eh? so my father was just look, look like like a pungulu eh? to the relatives. So they will seek advice from my father. Okay. Uh, so. They will seek advice if they have problems, uh, all kinds of problems, they seek the advice of my father. So he, my father is a kind of advisor, come consultant also, come counselor. Yeah? Uh, so, all right, uh, I just quickly showed, I forgot why this are the, uh, these are the, Small. Uh, this is Haji Hussein and Haji Jamal. Uh, Haji, Ash Haji Ashad, his brother Haji Hussein and Sanusi. This is my family. Mm -hmm. see. Wow. Like a teacher in one of the schools. That you go, that was the end of your slide. Huh? Nah, that was the that was your last slide. Near your last slide. Okay. Yeah. So this. Uh, uh, no, no. The one. Th this is uh, not yours. Yeah? So we can check here. Huh? Oh. No, check you stop, stop. Check you stop. Oh. Check you stop. Oh, Jangan, saya kontrol, saya kontrol. Okay. Okay. Leave it, leave it, leave it. Okay. Uh, Cikgu, don't click anything. Eh? Don't click, don't click. Don't click, okay. Ah, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Okay, <laughs> just okay. click for me. Yeah. Okay. Okay, this is a uh, teacher of one of the schools. Someone, someone click? Oh, <laughs> and some more? Dah, dah bis. Please. This is your last slide. Oh, so in fact, uh, uh, okay, can you turn to the 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 other one? Another, uh, okay, this one. This one is the uh, we have this, uh, you know, there's a kind of race riot, riot in 1964. So they have kind of good good committees, and after that. We come, we come, we come very close, closer to 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 the normalies, and uh, and this is the the function that we have uh, after uh, the racial riot, 1964. Okay. So I think uh, that's about it. Okay. Got <laughs> time, huh? Got time? Yes. Huh? You you have. Yeah. Oh, I thought you, 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 you,
Sorry, Lisa, your second slide, you haven't moved. Slides. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Uh, you, you can tell us more about the pictures. You okay. can tell us more about the pictures. Okay. Uh, uh, so, this uh, Singap uh, in our American, uh, you know, things were, at first, we are very, you know, we live in, in peace. And, uh, but when uh, something happens, uh, unexpected things happen, which is uh, unfortunate that racial crash right, happened. So uh, there's a time when the people in Romaikan, the all the races, we get together, we form a good community, and you know, and if we come closer with the other races. Eh? Uh, in fact, uh, uh, until now, I can still remember uh, the time when uh, we have to, we were very scared, we have to wait, we have to look after our our place, uh, and majority of Malays and few Chinese and Indians, in fact, we, we, protect, we protect them, you know, just in case they were they are very afraid. So he said, "Anything, anybody come from other borders, we are going to protect you. Don't worry." So we become so close with them, and then that's why we had this kind of party and this kind of. Uh, okay. Uh, then. Uh, Back or forward? Back and forward. Come on. Come on. Again? Come on. Try. Okay. So, uh, this one, this is uh, the, the photo of uh, myself in primary school. I went to Tuk Rao Primary School. This is photo. Okay. Let's pick some. Uh, this, uh, my family, my brother, my sister, eh? and uh, the extreme life is myself. Eh? Okay, I think uh, <laughs> that's about all. Uh, so, uh, this. This is the way that, uh, this is uh, how I can really, uh, uh, how I feel about the house and how I make sure that I build the house and, and it gives us a kind of uh, nostalgia and it gives us, because uh, we were once staying there, I was, also, I was, I was born there and and from, from the time I was born until 1974, we left and we bought a flat in Padok. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, thank you, Jake Gu. Um, yes, yeah, thank you. I think um, in, in my conversations with Jake Gu and also I think uh, Zain throughout the research process, uh, some of the things we gathered from Jake Gu is um, he comes from a family of uh, not only wealthy diamond traders, but also uh, from the line of uh, ulamas, uh, which is another aspect of Cikgu Silicon Duduk, another aspect of the Banjaris uh, stereotype even, perhaps, right? You're, you're either rich from diamond trading or you're overly religious, right? Um, so these are some of the things that we wanted to highlight, uh, particularly people like Haji Mahmud bin uh, Abdul Rahim, uh, the, his three sons. Uh, these people were... Um, were successful in their trade, uh, they owned properties, um, and they were representatives uh, of their communities. Uh, one of them became a mufti. So, uh, in the context of Singaporean's modern history, th these guys could be considered uh, some of our pioneers. Even though they're, they're small in numbers, uh, they contributed significantly to the development of Singapore. And um, thank you, Cikgu, for sharing. I, I, Cikgu stage fright sekejap tadi. Stage fright sekejap, saya suruh cepat eh. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Technology kadang-kadang gitu, cikgu. Yeah.
Yeah. Um, I, I like to highlight one, one aspect. Um, the, they are descendants from Haji Arshad al-Banjari. This is a very popular name uh, within the Banjari community, a very important person. Um, he wrote this uh, treatise, perhaps, uh, Sabil al-Mutadin, which later became uh, the, the, the model for the formation of the kingdom of Banja uh, some centuries ago. So a, a very important lineage, uh, and uh, his descendants, some of them who also become ulamas uh, in Banjarmasin and also in, in Singapore, are as very revered and very respected still. So, Cikgu Ghazali has a lot more information that we can tease out from him. So, if anyone would be interested to do a bit more research, he's a very important resource to have. Right? Thank you, Cikgu. Um, okay, moving on. So, these two ladies to my right, um, Puan Faiza, Puan Puan Puteh. Eh, Fauzia, pakai baju putih, and Puan Farida, uh, pink. Uh, they grew up in Jalan Pisang. Uh, they have very fond memories of running around Kampung Glam uh, as children. Um, in our conversations, uh, we found some very interesting uh, nuggets uh, from, from their childhood. Um, how their house was, uh, how they lived within the community, uh, and some of the key moments, I think. Um, there, there are a few firsts, I think, I hope you, you share. First time kahwin Okay, uh, so without further ado, I'd like to uh, give the floor to Puan Fa uh, Falida and Puan Fauzia. Silakan. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. And I would like to thank uh, MHC and Jamal and his colleagues for organizing this. We are so happy to share this with you. I would like to give a little bit more background, which I didn't grow up in, but what I understand from my late father, Haji Ahmad Jamal, from my uncle, uh, the husband of my dad's sister, uh, dad sister Haji Uthman Karim, that when my late grandfather, Haji Muhammad Hassan, and two more brothers, uh, Haji Muhammad Ali and Haji uh, Abdul Samad, so the three brothers came to Singapore, and uh, they came, I, I want to give much earlier history. So they came from Matapura, uh, what, believe, what we believe from my father. Th and you know, my late father never sat down and said, okay, this is our history. No, it was just, by the way, this is what happened. And it was much later in our life. That means uh, maybe about a few years before my father passed away. So what he said was, my grandfather came via... Um, we believe by a, by a Dutch steamship from Matapura, I believe they would have stopped over at Batavia. And interestingly, they went up to uh, Siam, Golo. Okay? So uh, from that, that is they went down to Singapore, so through Malaya. Uh, I believe it was a commercial mileage. Jadi mungkin uh, you can get more business al along the way, I believe, until they, they reach Singapore and uh, settle in Jalan Pisang. Why Jalan Pisang? I suppose it's Kampung Glam was already the thriving hub of commerce. There were Indians, Chinese, Pakistanis and all that. So this was the hub. So uh, um, from that story, uh, we believe that Jalan Pisang, had, there were a few of the, uh, the, the shop houses which were used as centers or uh, for diamond cutting. There were lathe machines this large if you know what lathe machines look like, and then the smaller machines for cutting and polishing. Uh, we personally have not seen that in Jalan Pisang, but that was the much earlier history. And by the time we grew up, when my father uh, started his business uh, in Jalan Pisang with our living room, our, his office in the day and at night, it was our study space. So um, that was where he would receive clients, you know, customers which were among them were our own relatives, distant relatives and friends around that. And a lot, actually, the Malay Muslim community, uh, including even the Arabs, especially the Aljunids and all that, they were our, uh, our, my father's customers. Now, my grandfather had wanted my father to be a lawyer and or to be a businessman, yeah. Okay, but my father was very much a musician as well. But of course, orang dulu-dulu, if you know, like Piramli story, uh, siapa, you know, like, you know, magistrate, yeah, art music, no, you're not going to do that. And my father used to, like, and I need to add this a little bit, because he, after Victoria School, he would go to the, uh, the Radio Malaya Bracket Singapore, the uh, radio station to sing in his Victoria School uniform, knock on the door, get himself auditioned by 
the conductor at that time, there was a Dutch conductor of the, Malay, the Radio Malaya Orchestra that was probably Gus Tyne. So um, at the same time, he was artistic. So he, I guess he had some business uh, uh, inclination. So he was trained to not just do a business, but he was very good at artwork. So he was uh, designing costume, uh, what costume, designing the jewelry items. Okay, so living in Jalan Pisang, life was seeing um, relatives when the doors open, they will just come on, come inside, hi, you know, kind of thing, and then clients come in. And um, I, when I was probably in, a, in about three years old, I would always see our uh, male relatives. They will congregate. So 14 Jalan Pisang was the hub of grand uncles, cous uh, parents, cousins, or my father's cousins. By the way, my parents are cousins. They are first cousins. Uh, so Haji Muhammad Ali is my, my mom's father. And Haji Abdul Samad is the other one. So I suppose in terms of business, my grandfather, Haji Hassan, was like the CEO. Then Haji Muhammad Ali was like the uh, what, HR, <laughs> bringing in the craftsmen. He returned to, to Jakarta or Batavia at that time. And then Haji Abdul Samad was the promoter, the marketing officer, the marketing manager. He later went on to establish business in Bangkok, so in Penang and Bangkok. So they have houses there, their properties there. An amazing team of uh, three brothers, you know, see the Saleh brothers, right? So Haji Hassan Muhammad Saleh. So uh, living in Jalan Pisang, you were seeing how my father yeah, designed uh, the jewelry for relatives, for clients, so essentially that. And then outside Jalan Pisang at Kaki Lima, the five foot way, kita main teng teng, you know, we, we, it was just fun running in and out of, of relatives' houses, uh, relatives' houses, neighbors' houses. Uh, Haji Manan, Sheikh Haji, his children were our friends. We learned Ngaji from his daughter, Haji Manan's daughter, uh, Kak Gaya. And then later on, I studied uh, Ngaji with Dr. Haji, uh, what's his name, Bak Baka Bashwan, who was staying uh, along the North Beach Road, just outside of Jalan Pisang. Okay, so and then later I went to Masjid Sultan to learn the Quran. So yeah, so essentially, we had a very interesting life, simple life, and and then you know what I like most is um, because we 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 live in the entire house, right? But in some houses in shop in in Jalan Pisang, the uh, residents below are not the same family as those above. So right in front of us was brand ring. What is it called? Boxing ring brand embrocation, like I think they made oil ointments. So above them was this family, other family, and instead of coming down, they were too lazy, I suppose, to, to, to buy food or whatever it is. So the peddlers would come down, they would throw baskets, you know, and I would copy the same thing. I have a little basket and I do the same thing as well. So this was the fun thing we had with uh, living in Jalan Pisang. I think my sister will continue. Pause here. Well, so Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yes, uh, continue on from where my sister left off. Um, this house in Jalan Pisang, which uh, is still standing there, uh, we still have that house, thank goodness. Um, it was my grandfather's very first property. When he came here, uh, he brought with him as a seed money from uh, his mother, my great grandmother, um, whose husband, my great grandfather, was also a diamond merchant. But when he came here, he did not settle here. He went back to uh, Matapura. Um, I still have cousins in Banjar Masin, uh, Matapura whose business is still in Diamond. They're still uh, dealing in a small uh, way. Um, apparently, my cousins, my mother's uh, brothers, eldest brother, uh, children, his, his children, still living in Matapura. And apparently, in Banjar Masin, which is about an hour and a bit from Matapura, uh, they're still trading in, in precious stones and diamonds. But according to them, they said their customers were mostly at that time, I don't know about now, but it was Korean, they were Koreans, they were Japanese, um, who came to buy, you know, uh, loose stones, not, not set. Uh, although I have some cousins in Indonesia uh, who are actually uh, dealing in, also in a smaller way, uh, not shops, they don't have shops, they actually deal direct selling. Um, they would sell um, diamonds, but already set in jewelry pieces. Now, um, in Jalan Pisang alone, when I was growing up, uh, there were no, like my sister said, there, was no, there were no more machines uh, or diamond cutting, diamond polishing. But what I remember, across the road, uh, where uh, the 
row of houses right now will be occupied mostly by Haji Mamuna restaurant. The second house, like was number, number 19, uh, was also uh, my maternal grandmother's uh, family property. And that place um, was occupied. Part of it, uh, it was a family, our relative was, uh, were living there. But my, my uncle, my father's uh, brother-in-law, my uncle, who's married to his sister, younger sister, had um, a business there. He used his office uh, for his diamond trading. And he was very much into the Chinese market. He was, uh, his uh, business was mostly with, the, with Chinese, uh, like people like Min Singh, Po Heng, all these people were his contacts as well as my father's. Now, further down that row of Jalan Pisang, there were a couple of other houses. Um, some of them were officers at that time. There were no, like I said, no more uh, work, workmen as in uh, craftsmen, but traders. And one of them was Haji Yusuf. Haji Yusuf, uh, so another relative, my grand uncle, um, he was actually one of the most international uh, based, you know, uh, diamond trader. Uh, and he's, he, he was uh, the very first, I think, Banjaris, or even a uh, first Muslim, or um, uh, Malay man, sorry, uh, to be a member of the Singapore um, International, you know, the, the country club, the island country club. He was a golfer. He has a wonderful car. I love, I love his car. He was this, like a vintage car that was seen only in movies, in the Hollywood movies of the 50s. Now, he was occupying one of the offices there. Um, along the, the road, we had another, um, uh, I think another office by another uh, uncle, a grand uncle. Now, you think I've been surrounded by diamonds. You know, growing up, you know, diamonds my first best friend. Um, in fact, my very first diamond I received when I was one year old. And the ring, uh, now I pass it to my very first grandniece, my brother's uh, first granddaughter. When she turned one, I gave that ring to her. But it was uh, full of nostalgia because that was the first ring, first diamond ring I received on my first birthday. I think it was made by my grandfather. Now, um, not just my grandfather, uh, paternal grandfather's side, but also my maternal sorry, side. Like my sister had said, uh, my father's mother, uh, father was also in the diamond trade. Now, um, although he was the HR man at that time. Now, my grandmother, my father's uh, mother, uh, was also uh, a daughter of diamond traders. So his, her brothers, her father, so I've been surrounded by all these uh, diamond merchants around me, except the fact that my father himself never passed the trade to us. I would watch when I was uh, still in school how he would weigh his diamonds and diamond pieces uh, the scale you would see in the measurement uh, and the scales that, that he used, uh, you would see it in the gallery um, when you go around the exhibition today. Now, uh, I would see him, how he weighed, very meticulous. He's a very meticulous man. In fact, even his box of uh, the weights, the scale, still had his name. He would have labeled everything that he had. Some of the items that he kept even had dates on them. I think the stick, the ring stick you see uh, uh, in the exhibition, I think I believe he has also got a date on it. So like I said, he's very meticulous. And um, unfortunately, it was not passed down to me. But uh, the other thing he, he would do when he weighed his diamonds, he, after that, he would um, trace some designs, which I would watch uh, in the evening, of course, doing my homework and watching him doing these uh, designs. I got very um, you know, engrossed into it. I mean, like, I was really interested in what he was doing. And at one point, I said, I'd like to... You know, I like art a lot in school, so I said, let me take over some of his, you know, tracing, was tracing the, de the, the design. I didn't design it, I just saw him doing design, and I just said, can I trace some of the designs? And um, further down, I actually got my, uh, uh, you know, my help was sought by my father to uh, help him, because he had some rush uh, work to do for his clients, and he said, okay, you can help me to do some of these things. So yeah, I did, and then... And as a payment, he did not pay me in, in cash, but he paid me in kind. So I had two little diamonds, uh, loose diamonds. He said, now you have this and uh, do your own design. You can have uh, this set. I'll get my you know, workman from, uh, I think, one of the Chinese uh, um, jewelers uh, had got a craftsman that he could use, and he got them set for me. And I designed my little, uh, I was still in school, so it would be very basic, very simple, but um, in white diamond, I'm, sorry, white, uh, white gold. You know, people, at that time, they think white gold is much more fashionable, you know. 
So I get, got it done and he gave us, uh, he made them for me. I still have them. Now, uh, the other thing about uh, living in Jalan Pisang, just now, just like to follow up from uh, Cik Ahmad Ghazali said about the racial riot. Now, as a little girl, I still remember how my house was, I think, a, a, like a refuge place when there was a racial riot. Uh, a lot of relatives came, a lot of the Banjaris relatives, even fr friends, relatives, friends, were all there on the street because our house uh, was not, right, right now is at the very end of, the, of the, the lane and then you see the main road, Victoria Street. Previously, we had a buffer, so we didn't have that much noise. So there was a building just um, along the, um, the, the road next to us, there's a little lane and there was a coffee shop at one time and the coffee shop was leaning against a block of apartments, about, I think, four-story high. Um, and that block of apartments really, uh, like I said, leaving a, giving us a buffer from the noise of the street and the Victoria Street at that time. Now, that um, street was on the Prophet Muhammad's uh, birthday celebration. I still remember, as a little girl, we would all run out and watch the procession. So as, it, as the procession went along, we had you know, relatives, like I said, People coming around there, and suddenly the racial riot. You know, I didn't know what happened, so I was the first one, one the first one to get into the house. My mom, you know, said, "Get in, get in, get in the house." So not only just us. Suddenly, the whole lot of people, our relatives, our friends, who were watching the uh, procession, all took refuge. All came to the house. And I remember there were about maybe about forty odd people in our house overnight. We had nothing much to to, to serve them, and we had you know because suddenly the government uh, imposed a curfew. And what did we do? And we had to eat something, you know, we had to feed these people who were, who were staying and we had pillows littered everywhere and we had uh, mattresses brought out, you know, and, and people were staying the night until the first thing in the morning when the curfew was lifted, they all left. But luckily, we were not very away, far away from a provision shop um, just on the other side of Jalan Pisang. So they brought some uh, big cans of Kong Guan biscuits, you know, and we were distributing wafers and biscuits and all over to just to survive overnight. Now, um, that was the racial riot in 1964. Fortunately, I was still a little girl too, but I still remember how crowded my house was for the overnight. Now, um, one of the other things I'd like to um, share with you, um, I was actually the very first, I think I was the very first, because my father, um, at that time, he's retired from the diamond trade, and he decided to be a trustee of the Sultan Mosque, uh, being a very religious man, and he would uh, you know, spend a lot of time there, in the, in the office of the uh, Southern Mosque. So when it's time for me to get married, I said, this house is too small to have everybody you know, to come in and, and witness the marriage ceremony, the nikah ceremony. So I asked his permission. I said, could I have uh, my ceremony held in the Masjid Sultan? Because I know my friends, Catholic friends, would have their you know, ceremonies in the church, in the cathedral. I said, why can I have it in, my, you know, in the Southern Mosque, which is across the road? I said, yeah, why not? You know, so, so I think I was one of the first ones to actually now it's pretty, uh, pretty common to see um, the marriage ceremony to be held in the, in the Southern Mosque. But at that time, it was still quite a novelty. So, um, while the ladies' prayer room was upstairs, the hall, the men's downstairs, which is happening right now, um, our wedding ceremony is the same thing. So, we had uh, sex segregation, the men down, downstairs in the main hall, and the ladies in the upstairs. So, I was in the upstairs, and so today, my husband asking me, was I married to, to you or, or to the Kadi? Because, you know, when the, the ceremony he was holding hands, shaking hands with the, the, the official from the Sharia court, and there was a Kadi. So then he was brought upstairs to me, you know. Okay, that was uh, part of the Nikah ceremony. And because we were pretty close to Arab Street, so I decided since it's very close to, also close to the Masjid Sultan, so we had our uh, reception at the, what is now the Golden Landmark and the, I think it's called Village Hotel now, I'm not sure now. It was at time, it was called Golden Village and the Golden Landmark Hotel. And there was a, a huge hall um, where we had our traditional Banjaris uh, wedding uh, outfit. So uh, I think my cousin at that time who got it imported from Banjarmasin, so um, I was wearing it for the first time. I think that was also very brand new, and the whole um, ceremony, the, the dice, the plumbing, as well as the, uh, the uh, tangkolok, she was wearing like, uh, the Malays would call it tanja, I think, right? The, the headgear, 
which my poor husband, a Scottish man, had to wear. And uh, so he had to have this very high headgear. And, and we all had the whole you know, event from 12 o'clock to 5 o'clock. Uh, we changed from our nikah ceremony, which was all in white, into this wedding uh, outfit in, in Banjari's traditional Banjari's outfit, which you can actually have a look at in the, in the gallery as well. It's a gallery too. Now, um, what else can I share with you about bringing Banjaris? Now, we had our, my grandfather, uh, after you know, having established his business here, he was quite well known, not just with the Chinese, but also with the Jewish um, businessmen. Now, he was uh, so established that even the British decided to confer him the, um, the justice of peace, you know, which, mean, which, which meant he would be able to marry people off, you know. So my, this was what my father told me. He said, uh, your grandfather didn't, didn't, I said, did he take it up? He said, no, he turned it down. I said, why would he turn it down such, a, such an honor from the British, uh, you know, government? He said, no, because if he were to become a JP, uh, he might not be able to mix, you know, as freely with his Banjaris community, with, you know, simple people. He was a very simple uh, kind of, you know, guy. He, he, he wasn't very lavish. He wasn't very ostentatious. So because of that, he was... Um, he turned it down. He said, no, no, I just want to be an ordinary trader. That's it, you know. Then during the, the, the um, I remember my uncle told me once that during the Japanese World War, uh, the Japanese, Japanese occupations here, during the Second World War, he decided to take his family for one year uh, for safe, safe, uh, safe, uh, you know, to, to safe uh, protection and so on. He moved them from Jalan Pisang to Lora Marzuki up in the Changi Road, not far from... Uh, North American on that area. There was actually a, a little um, community of Banjaris around that area, apart from Dan Pachitan, uh, Marikan, and Marzuki. So they moved there for one year to get away from Dan Pisang because they knew that you know the Japanese would be looking out for them, you know, for the especially for the diamonds. Yeah. And then what happened was uh, while he was in Geelong, we, my grandfather bought the next property, uh, a, a lovely bungalow. You know, freestanding bungalow along Geelong Road, just between Lone 35 and 37, not far from where the Aljunits had their, their residence in Lone 37. Now, in that house, he was there at one time, looking very, sim you know, like his uh, usual clothes in his, you know, Skyrim play card and his, you know, simple white singlet. So when the Japanese um, soldiers marched in, the, the Japanese officers marched into the house and wanted to take over that house. And they looked at him and said, who's the master here? We want, to, uh, we want to meet the master. Who's the owner of this house? So my grandfather, being a very religious man, he was saying prayers under his breath, you know. And he said, oh, not here, not here, you know. So he was mistaken for a kabun, pakabun, you know. He was like a gardener. So he thought he was a gardener. So they were very angry because they couldn't meet the, the owner of the house. So they walked out. So alhamdulillah. So the house was saved from the... Japanese occupation. They would have taken it over. And as you know, during the, the wars, whether it's over here or anywhere in the world, the, the occupied, you know, the, the army that occupied the country would immediately just, uh, you know, take over your, your property, you know. So they were thinking of taking over the Geelang house. So they didn't, anyway. So what happened was uh, they went back to Jalan Pisang and, and not just the four of us, myself and my three siblings were born in Jalan Pisang. My father and his siblings were also born there. So we, would, we did not move. So when we were asked by Jamal, when did we move to Jalan Pisang? He said, we would never move. We moved out of there, but we were born there. So uh, my family, my parents did not believe in being, you know, uh, having us born in Kandang Kerbau Hospital. We didn't sound very nice, KK, you know, Kandang Kerbau Hospital. So he said, uh, no, we have the Bidan, the midwife, come over to the house. And we were all, uh, you know, uh, born in the actual house on the Ambin. I don't know if you know what is Ambin. It's like a, like a kind of a strange sitting area, very square box like that. And we use that a lot, you know, when uh, it's like next to, in the kitchen area, um, where we would have this funny swing, you know. When there's a baby, they would swing the boy, would, we would put there, and, and, and all four of us, like we were born there. And my, uncle, my father and his brothers, uh, he had six siblings, also born in that same house. So the house had held a lot of pro uh, memories for us. Um, I'm so glad, glad that it's still there, standing, and, and uh, it was in disrepair for many years after my father's death in 2000. So I decided, you know, we could not leave it in that condition. 
So I had letters come from URA sending me, you've got to do something about this because it's in the conservation area. So you've got to do something about the house. So I managed to find resources somewhere and, and I did that house up. You know, and now it's, uh, it's still a lovely house, uh, which I'm very proud to see it everything, every time I pass by. It's still uh, occupied by our family, you know. Uh, although I've got the downstairs rented out. Eh? But uh, every time we pass by, it's, you know, my, my grandparents' pride and glory and my father's as well. Yeah? Incidentally, when he passed away, the day that he passed away, he actually went back to that house. Although it was not occupied, he went back there, he made some calls to my father, to my brother in, in Malaysia, and, and then he had his lunch in, in Haji Mamuna. So he passed his last moment also back in Jalan Pisang. Yeah? So that was a very uh, sad moment for us all. But um, like I said, we have not continued his business. None of us actually had um, you know, been trained, although he could see that I had some interest in, in diamonds. You know, which, which woman, which girl doesn't, right? So, um, so actually, what happened was I did not take over the kind of business that he was in. I think it was too, being a gemologist or something, it's a bit too complicated for me. So I decided to take up uh, costume de jewelry design in, in Italy, in Florence. And that was, you know, a kind of a, a tribute to my father's uh, trade in, 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 uh, in the jewelry business too. Right, I'll hand over my uh, mic. Right, um, but what we got from our father, amazingly, because he was an artist, right, for designing uh, jewelry. Thank you. Don't yeah. Yeah. And, um, and from him also, he was also a singer, as I said, a very good baritone singer singing Kronchung and Langam. So what happened was, I believe that our, his talents were split into two of us. So I was, I was the one who took up the music uh, uh, interest, uh, Right up to now, teaching Ang Klong full time, and like my sister's doing art part, the you know the artistic part. Now I would like to to share what my uncle Saleh out there has shared with me. This video of his late father, um, Adi, uh, what I mean, I call him uh, Kai Ahmad. Okay, they used to stay at Lorong Duaplo now, Lorong Twenty Six. He was an avid filmmaker, and uh, let's let's share this video. Um, where this was, um, this I believe was a gathering of the uh, Banja, no not Gilang, this, this was po most possibly at some villa, villa, the bungalow, a holiday bungalow in the east coast, right? Um, but much of it was just the men, <laughs> uh, I believe, yeah. So. Uh, what year could this have been? Around 50s? Okay, so you know sound here. So um, our relatives who are here may recognize some faces. Uh, that's your father, right? Yes, Arakai Ahmad. Okay, I always remember him like that. I just remember him like that with his cigar at Laurel 26, Gelang. Oh, that's my father with the uh, water... Yeah. Okay, those were the days right, when you eat with your hands and then uh, that's a bumming, a smile. Um, well, look at those chairs, those pretend chairs. I think this was a bungalow and then I believe this, this could have been a wedding. Yes, wedding. And I love their attire. They were still in their kabaya and the bun. This looks like Jalan Pisang. That's the Amben. That's my Jalan Pisang house. That's where... Uh, I, it was also my uh, little playhouse. I would walk on the, that's my mum, okay, I will walk on the acting like a teacher, you know, with a blackboard, okay, oh, that's um, the airport, uh, Paya Leba Airport, no? Is it? Kalang. Kalang, sorry, yes, okay, uh, look at this, I think this is Kalang Airport, that's right, yeah, that's right, uh, arriving or fetching some relatives, is that my uncle? Is that? Okay. Um, it was his Vauxhall. I think my late grandfather's car. Now, talk about being humble. Amazingly, you know, they drove right, fantastic cars at that time. You know, humble and yet, well, car. That's my dad. Okay. Um, I'm not sure whether this is uh, 681 Gelang Road or could have been Lorong 26. Sorry? Lorong 26? Yeah. Quite similar, that's why it's a little confusing for me. <laughs> so, Lorong 26, so not far from our family house at 681 Geelang Road, which is on the main road. 
Right, yes, just to add on um, regarding the Gelang House, it was also the hub for a lot of Kunduris, a lot of gatherings. So there were just so many relatives and relatives' relatives. So it was a lot, including, yes, yeah, so uh, Chegu, or what, who I call Abba Ghazali's uh, uh, father, right, who would lead the uh, Tahlil. Oh, it's, it's an amazing family thing. So I think growing up as a Banjaris was. Um, a lot of uh, kanduri, a lot of for, for me at home, it was a lot of singing. So we, we were woken up and it was, we were, you know, like lullaby, my father would sing Serunai Malam on the, what we call the Krosi Malas, the rattan lounge chair. Right, so that's it. Thank you very much. That's our sharing. Assalamualaikum. Okay, um, thank you, um, <coughs> Fauzia and Farida. Uh, for those of you here, if you got married in Masjid Sultan, you have her to thank uh, for, for kick starting the trend. Um, I think it's, it's quite clear from your sharing that, uh, for everyone, that the, the Banja community's uh, influence in, in Singapore, even though despite their, their small numbers, is, is quite significant. Uh, in, in your video you shared, in the villa, all the men are wearing suits, they, they all look quite posh, lah. Eh? Uh, they all look quite quite posh. Uh, you know, you, you have people who have uh, ju justice of peace, uh, people who are leaders of the communities, uh, owners. Um, I think one of the one of the things that we we, we try to figure out uh, throughout the, the the research period uh, is, um, so the Banjaris came. We know they, they traded in in diamonds. Um, we sort of have some idea where they sort of lived. We only know. Uh, of Jalan Pisang, uh, Omar Guzuki. We we've heard of um, uh, Kampung Intan, but we, we we didn't manage to find anyone who who had memories of of Kampung Intan. Uh, if for your information, Kampung Intan uh, is believed to be uh, in Baghdad Street, junction of Baghdad Street and Arab Street, and it's called Kampung Intan because uh, that's where there was uh, a thriving Banjari diamond trade going on. Um, what we didn't really know is where else the Banjas also lived, right? Um, so we, we found evidence that they also lived in, uh, in Minto Road. Uh, that's why Encik Rosli was supposed to come and share about Minto Road. We, we only knew Minto Road as um, uh, an area uh, of Baoyanis area, actually. There's a pondo, uh, Baoyan, in, in Minto Road. Um, but we didn't know there were also Banjaris people there. Uh, so there's quite a number of properties, quite a number of areas uh, that uh, were said to be associated with the Banjaris people. Uh, I'm quite curious. Uh, first generation, diamond traders, property owners, um, quite rich, quite posh, go anywhere, wear suits. Um, and then, uh, you know, they didn't hand down this uh, trade to, to the next generation. And then you guys also shared about uh, you pinda, you, you moved house. Um, was was this uh, was the context of this moving? Did it have anything to do with uh, um, mass? <coughs> sorry, <coughs> uh, we, I think during uh, post independence, we shifted people out of the kampongs into HDB flats. Uh, is this one of the reasons why you guys had to move? Uh, and could you share a bit of that with me? Like the mass relocation to HDB, did it have an impact on your family's trade on your? Uh, also, your family's uh, relations with each other, because you sort of used to live next to each other, and now you're on in flats. I think um, in my parents' uh, case, uh, we were all married by that time, except my sister, who was still with my parents. At that time, the house uh, decided, they decided to just keep it as an office, and it wasn't in a very good condition. But so they decided that, you know, he wanted to. They, my father decided he wanted to move into an apartment, which is easier to manage and so on. Um, I said it's no longer trading in, in diamonds, so he was at the time a, re, uh, a trustee of the Southern Moors. He would still come almost every day to the house, and spend time in, in the moss, and sometimes even when uh, overnight he would stay the night there, and then he would uh, go back the following day back to uh, back to his house in East Coast. I mean, on the east side of Singapore. So I, my, I when I married, I moved right away. My brothers also living in Malaysia, another sister moved out after they got married, so there was just the three of them. Mm. So they decided maybe it's time to move to an apartment, and then that house was uh, just used as an, as an office, just as a base for him, to be in town, 
um, without having to sometimes to stay over. You know, he could stay over. He doesn't he didn't have to keep coming back at home at yeah. nights. Yeah. Sorry, Chico, maaf. Sebelum Chico respond, I forgot to mention. Uh, if you came late, if you want to post a questions, please uh, refer to the QR code, and then I will be able to receive a question on my cell phone. Okay. Sorry. Silakan, Chico. Yes. Uh, for my family. Yeah, it's on. For my family, uh, the reason for for us to move to flats, eh? Uh, towards the end of seventies, uh, uh, eh? Uh, there's strong rumors that uh, the government was Encouraging, encouraging people to build uh, wooden houses, no? and encouraging people to brick house, to, to brick, brick house. So that's one of the reasons that we move from the American to flats, uh, so, so, and then we sold the house, uh, eh? uh, of course. And then, uh, and of course, the government will at at that uh, point in time. Eh? So there are very strong rumors that the mm. We have to move. Yeah, to it's a policy. Uh, like that's that's no policy. Yeah. Uh -uh. Uh, so, so, so the best thing we, we sell the house, and then more and more people in that Lorong eh, are selling the house, and so. Uh, well, yeah. it, it must have been very sad, right? It must mm. have been quite a tragic yeah, la. Uh, moment in your history. Mm. But the fact that we stayed at the uh, Uren House, uh. so there's no a kind of uh, no prospect of staying longer. In that place, mm. uh, so so the best is to to move out and buy flats, uh. um, I think um, one of one of the things we, we, we try to understand in, in Singapore's history because Singapore uh, we progress so much, right? Uh, so quickly, uh, so fast that uh, there is um, sometimes no time to document things before they disappear. Uh, um, for us to trace back where Banja people used to live and all that really depends on, on the memories of people who are still here. Uh, because like, uh, Dr. Effendi also struggled to find some research material on the Banja community. We, we go all the way back to 1890 and then gap. And then the next thing we know is just pre-war. You shared a bit about just pre-war. So there's a few decades missing in terms of how we understand uh, our communities in Singapore and how it developed. Um, also, the, the research perhaps suggested um, trade exchanging between uh, Borneo, Banyamasin and Singapore and uh, on so forth, but did not really specify uh, any Banjaris areas right, in your research. Were you able to find any evidence that the Banjars yeah. occupied any areas where they lived when they were here? None whatsoever. Um, the only visible reports that I can, I can find is what that 1941 thing. And some uh, mention of... 1941? Yeah, the, the, just oh. now, 1941. And some mention of, you know, the, the relatives uh, uh. That, uh, that are mentioned here. Uh, the Mahmoud. Yeah, so, yeah, so uh, I found some sources, you know, but too insignificant to mention. Too, well, very little, it's very scarce on the data. Mm. Yeah. yeah, just thin on the ground. So this, this how, how would they mention in the British sources, Haji Mahmoud? Uh, yeah, on some territory. Uh, basically, what... They mentioned uh, uh -huh. about uh, about this person, yeah, about the, the area's own, yeah. See, it's it's true. You didn't make this up. It's it's covered in British sources. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, it doesn't fit the narrative. Uh, 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 so, Haji Mahmud, uh, uh, for, from what I understand, uh, the British and the Chinese, uh, they really depend on him and the skill, no. So, whatever, whenever they are going to determine the quality of the diamonds, eh, mm. they will see him, Haji Mahmud. No? So he, he was also a consultant for the British? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. That's why he called yeah. Haji Mahmud Dil Belian, he called it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what the British know him as also, ah, yeah. or the community. Yeah. 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 No, likewise for, uh, I think, Haji, Haji Omar, right? Eh? Uh, he's, he's, he's so wealthy, he's known as Haji Omar Kaya, right, eh, Cikgu? Haji Omar Kaya. Ah, Osman, Haji, sorry, Haji Osman Kaya. They're either Haji Osman Banja or Kaya. The, the banja and kaya interchangeable. <laughs> yeah. I, I would like to add a little bit on this now. The amazing thing is, like you said, as much as there's this, you know, uh, being posh and all that, there is this very strong essence in the banja community of being very understated. Mm. Like what she mentioned about our grandfather, so, you know, about the Gilang House and the Japanese and all that, and the J JP, Justice of Peace. So there's a very understated thing. And also, um, 
uh, if you want to compare with the other communities like the Minangs and the uh, Bugis, the Banjaris, whom we know, did not bring the full range of their culture. You mm. know, like we don't have uh, dance, we don't bring in actual literary writers and all that. So essentially, they were traders or craftsmen. And then just to add about properties, there were also, I think, around uh, Juchat Place, um, uh, Crane Road, there were a lot of properties, in, including... Uh, Bukit Timah, which was sold much earlier. So they were buying properties. They were buying shop houses. They were buying land. They mm -hmm. were property owners. Uh, yes, so there were a lot of different properties. And yet, it was very understated. In terms of um, a vocation and profession, with my Haji Hassan being you know, not even an English educated, and yet he made sure that his children attended English education or English schools. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them, except one, uh, the late Haji Mahmud, my, a lot of similar names. So, uh, uh, Sky, uh, sorry, Abba Mahmud stayed in, ja in Jakarta. So, in other words, my father's, my grandfather's only son who was brought back by his grandmother to live all the way back in Matapura and then back to Jakarta. So, he was the only one who did not live in Singapore and did not get an English education. So, I feel very sad about that because he did not, you know, his family did not get the, um, the advantage. So, uh, but all of them, the rest of them went to Victoria School. And uh, much earlier when they were in primary school, they, some of them attended Geylang Malay School. And she, there was this particular Mr. Hamid who said, a friend, who said, why are you sending your children to Malay School? She said, send them to English School. At the same time, when, he sent my, when my grandfather sent his children, his sons, to English School, the community was saying like, Nanti jadi Christian. <laughs> Why are you sending your children to that? And my mom's cousin, uh, who really wanted to be a nurse, who wanted to learn the organ. And my grandfather, Haji Hassan, this is, we had not shared this, he was like the major general of the entire Banja community. He was in charge of looking after his, even his cousins, his, his yeah, cousins as well his, as, as his um, uh, nieces and nephews. So he would tell my, my auntie, no, 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 no. And he at that time also told my aunt, no, nothing jadi Christian. <laughs> so, but then by the time he had, his children wanted to go to school, you know, it's, you know, you go to Victoria School. So fortunately as well, so he did not pass the, not just the tech, the, not just the art and craft of, of his, you know, his vocation, uh, the interest also, so like my father never told us, okay, you must be a business person or you must go into diamond and all that. No, it's whatever you choose as what uh, our, also the man, Chegu Latif, who is in our Manja community said, uh, haram manyara, you know, so that one is really, really strong. Uh, so the, the fact is, it was not stated as such, we do not live by that proverb, but it was manifested in the way our parents taught us, whatever you do, whatever profession you do, do it well. So I, it happened to be for both of us too. So when I started teaching music, I just went on until now. So I think it is that element was really strong. And then I think about diamonds and all that, we just like to dress up. <laughs> right, so yeah, not showy, but we, that becomes us too. So yeah, about profession, we just did not do. I just wish the next batch of people. But one of our cousins in Jakarta, distant cousin, is her father. Her name is uh, Ka Erna. Erna's father, uh, Arakai, Arakai Jafar. Now, he was also a businessman. He stayed in Jakarta, of course, uh, in Diamond. Now, she, Ka Erna, went into Diamond business and beyond Diamond. Precious stones, she created her own. And then he, he went international. So, yes... And then our other distant cousin, Saida, also went into an interest into uh, gemstones and she got her supplies from, I believe, from Cambodia. So yeah, bits and pieces, we do hope that this interest is developed. And why my father did not continue, because by the 1980s, I remember when I finished A-levels, uh, the diamond industry in Singapore, literally diamond industries, they were producing cheap diamonds, small, tiny costume jewelry or Diamonds, but, you know, small. People were not wearing those chunky, you know, diamonds anymore. He's so afraid to wear. So th by that time, he said uh, he wanted to serve uh, the mosque. So he became a trustee. So, yeah, that's how it, uh, it ended, you know, in terms of the uh, diamond interest and the profession. Yeah. Actually, you answered the next question I wanted to ask because uh, we, we were going to allude to the, the, the decline of the, the diamond trade in Singapore, particularly Banjaris diamond trade. And I was uh, asking Fendi, 
because he, you did mention that there was a, a decline in, in um, a certain period, what was it, the 1890s, is it? 1890s onwards. 1890s onwards, because of the, they, they founded Diamond in South Africa. Um, and then there was a period where there was an increase in demand of diamond cutters. I thought that was quite interesting, you know, the difference between, the, it's quite significant, traders and cutters. Because uh, from what we can piece together, um, the earlier Banjaris were, were traders. Of course, they came with the cutters as well, I, I, I suspect, right? Um, and, there, there's, uh, and as traders, of course, I, I, I believe they would have certain uh, skills of cutting diamonds themselves. Right? Uh, but because of Dutch and British policies, for these guys to leave uh, Banjarmasin, to get through the net of the monopoly, to enter Singapore, um, very few actually managed to, to do this. Right? Um, and when there was a decline in interest for, for Banjaris diamonds, but an increase in demand of uh, Banjaris diamond cutters, I think that would definitely have had an impact on, on the, 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 the trade networks th th themselves. And I don't know whether later on that, that would, I think that's something we perhaps need to, some questions we need to ask, like, what really happened uh, during that period. Because it seemed like, you know, first generation got a lot of money, second generation got a bit, third generation no more already. Uh, that, that seems to be the case for migrant communities uh, around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the grandfather makes the... Yes, yes. Uh, by me, just a uh, comment. Uh, how long does it uh, take to polish a diamond? I don't know. How big is it? Uh, <laughs> I guess it would be several weeks if you want well, to protect I ask our cousins right? in Matapura. Yeah, well, okay. actually, um, my mother's elder brother, yeah. uh, Hadiya uh, Mu'in, he was uh, a diamond polisher. And he had, in fact, a uh, uh, polisher, yes. Cartoon polisher. What happened was he was very, uh, was actually very adept, very good at his, uh, what he was doing. Like, like my father, he never passed this art to his children. Um, he has been approached, as far as I, I learned from my father, one time he, my father said, he has been approached by many Chinese um, uh, goldsmiths or Chinese traders who wanted to learn from him. You know, he wanted him to impart some of his expertise to them. But he did not. He refused to let to teach anyone. He didn't even teach his own children. You know, least of yeah. all, teach a, yeah. how, a stranger. How long to polish one or two? The thing is, I've seen him working on his own. He had in, at that time he was living not far from us. Right. His family and his uh, well, not just him, his brother, younger brother, who's also my mom's uh, younger brother, uh, uh, Abdul Salim. He, they both lived with their children in a very uh, in a house which is I think a very. Um, numerous number of people living in that same house uh, in Dixon Road and now mm. in Kapong Kapor, which is uh, a walking distance from Jalan Pisang. So he was almost every day, he also, he and his brother would also come round to our place. Right. Now, uh, what he had was he had a separate little workshop um, and it's like a little cubicle that he, he had his machine there. I would sometimes very curious, I would just peer in, you know, but he. He's very, uh, he's very much a, a loner. You know, he's very much a, 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 not a team player at that time. He was just his own man, you know, his own uh, art. He's, he did his job well. I've actually never seen him finishing his job, but I've seen him at work in his little cubicle, which he built inside the, the grounds of his house. You know, it was a, another pre-war uh, shop house in Dixon Road. Now, from this story I heard uh, from um, my, my cousin, uh, one of my cousins, his children, his other children, said that when the Japanese also walked into the house looking for diamonds, mm -hmm. uh, yes, they were looking, they knew. I think they probably have zeroed in on who, who were the diamond cutters, diamond traders. And the Japanese walked into that house looking for the diamonds. So my grand-uncle, my, uh, my um, uh, grandfather's youngest brother, who was a trader, Ajib Samad, he told his wife to hide the diamonds. And you know why they hid them? In a little box, wooden box, behind two cupboards, and the, the space between the wall and the cupboard, that was where they, they lodged it, you know, really um, hit that cupboard with all the diamonds that he was trading in. That's how they managed to save some of those diamonds, uh, mm. you know, without being uh, confiscated by the, the Japanese. Yeah. But yeah. ma'am, you didn't answer his question. How yeah. long, how long did it take? <laughs> I have no idea, because right. uh, he's the always there. Yeah. He's always there yeah. in his workshop, okay. but, you know, he never actually let us uh, have a look at what he was doing. At yeah. that time, we were too young to even have any curiosity, you know, about, right. about the business. The reason for the question is because, you know, if it takes a long time to polish few diamonds, yeah. um, they will mean that, you know, the British had to carefully select 
the diamond cutter of choice, mm. right? They, it, therefore, it explains very selective. the inability for that industry to thrive because it is a very specialized skill mm. and you need people, uh, the best basically, to be on board with any attempt to produce an industry here. So that explains the lack of migration in a way uh, mm. to Singapore because it is not the uh, ordinary industry. You need good people, you need dependable people who can po uh, probably polish efficiently, you know, for a few customers to make money and it's not easy to make a guild. It's a specialty, uh, la, it's specialty, a specialty. Very yeah. specialized. So that explains partly, I think, the lack of, you know, an industry here. Mm. Um, okay, I'd I like to move away from the, the diamond trade and uh, just now you mentioned the, the, the Banjaris, despite being uh, you know, quite, quite well to do, uh, a bit under, quite understated. Uh, this alludes to the point of certain refinement in the Hikayat Banjar. I think uh, we shared a few lectures ago with Dr. Where Dr. Azhar shared about how the Banjaris saw themselves. Uh, they, they are very refined. Uh, the Javanese already think they're them refined, then the Banjar even more refined than the, than the Javanese. So, yeah. Um, but I think uh, one of the things also, uh, this is my own struggle coming out of the festival, so coming out of programs as part of the Orang Banjar Special Exhibition, is the lack of Banjaris uh, performative uh, culture um, in, in Singapore and material culture also, right? Um, I think we, we looked at some of the f uh, family photo albums. Uh, the, the first generation Banja come, come to Singapore, very swag, all wear suit, very western, right? Um, get married, either Malay, wear, wear, wear Malay traditional, or wear western, right? Um, there, there wasn't any, uh, they did not bring the, the, the Banja clothing, the Banja performances, Banja music. Uh, to, to Singapore. You got married in Masjid Sultan and you decided you wanted to represent. Right? You wanted to wear uh, the, the Banja thing. Um, why did you do that? Uh, and also, um, how is Banja uh, culture retained within the, the, the neighbourhoods that you come from? I think for Jalan Pisang, likewise for uh, Lorong Malikan. Right? How Banja was that for, for you guys? Well, um, first of all, I want to say that where the uh, our my, memory, my memories of uh, uh, Raya, uh, visiting the Banjaris relatives, they were mostly in that area, Lorong uh, Marikan, Pachitan, and Marzuki. These were just just this area alone, we could cover quite a few houses, mm. right? And um, so that area, there's a few Banjar families. Yeah, la. yeah. Okay. Just because uh, Kay Arsad mm. and Kay Hussein, uh, uh, they were both we call sorry we call our grand. Uh, so anybody that's, you know, like grandparents or we call it kai, is in like a grandfather on the male side. Uh, and then it's normal, it's a grandmother. Now, uh, Kai Hussein and Kai Ashad, we knew them all along when growing up. They were always very, very religious people. So they, we visited them for Hari Raya and, and also another, uh, where Haji Sanusi, his sister, um, whose brother, I'm sorry, sister's um, married, sister married a, a, another diamond trader as well. And apparently, um, this, auntie of, uh, this auntie of mine, my mother's cousin, the, the niece of Haji Sanusi, uh, once told me that my grandfather and her father, right, were both traders, this, this grandfather, that means her father used to live in Pachitan, they were peddling, just like, you know, CK Tang stories, selling linens, you know, uh, um, embroidered tablecloths, linens, door to door. They were doing that to start with. My grandfather was lucky to have some seed money. Like I said, he, she was, he was given some jewelry pieces by his mother when he, leaving him, I think in his teens. He was really not even 20 yet. He left, maybe I think about 18 or 19 years old, he left Banjarmasin, he left uh, Matapura to trade, right? So he and this uh, cousin of his um, would go around peddling to the Chinese, selling loose diamonds them, you know, I mean, he, sometimes he, he got lucky, sometimes he didn't, sometimes they, they shoo him out, you know, but he was peddling, that was how he started, very, very, uh, very hard way, you know, but, but he got, I think the resilience in our Banjaris, um, I think in our, it's in our DNA, I think, you know, we are very resilient people, he never gave up, despite being turned away sometimes by, you know, some of this, uh, he approached most of the customers were Chinese. That was what my this aunt so told me. It, it, it sounds like you're saying, okay, you don't really need the the performances. You don't so really they, need they, the they, they just to left behind all the. Their, their intention was just get yeah, to Singapore, 
it's really about uh, certain it's principles survival. and It's certain more about values. survival. Okay. So all the arts and craft of it just got left behind. So we saw, uh, our, we celebrated our cousin's wedding in Jakarta. Uh, they were all, you know, like us, second uh, generation uh, Banjaris. They were, um, some of them first generation. We saw the whole Banjaris uh, wedding in Jakarta. My, one of my cousins got married in very traditional Banjari style. And along with the, the dancers, they had a whole troop of dancers. Not like here, we would have the, the compound guys. Mm -hmm. Down there was a very big troop that I think there was a Banjari's community in Jakarta that they managed to you know, um, pay for, for their performance. And they accompanied the wedding couple okay, into I, the I hall. Think, uh, I need to interject. Yes. We, we stick to the Singapore. Right. So we, we didn't have that. Unfortunately, this, this uh, mm. art. Yeah, there was understand. nothing. Nobody brought that in yeah. to Singapore. Is, is that the same for you, Cikgu uh, Ghazali, in, in Lorong Marikan? The, 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 the tradition, yeah. how you know your banja in that community? You all speak banja or...? Okay, uh, microphone, Cikgu. Microphone. Cikgu, uh, microphone. Oh, sorry. For your... Uh, for their mother, mm. they speak banja. Mm. My, my mother and my father, uh, they self serum they don't speak Banjaris. They, they speak. That's why uh, I only learn Banja, Banjaris, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but Bahasa Banja only quite lately, you know. Because uh, they, we, are, we only know a few words when they say Japai, mm -hmm. eh, uh, Bagawi, mm -hmm. eh, Bagawi, Bagawi, and then Bahini, a few words only. But in, when, when you want to express yourself in, in Banja language, mm -hmm. you are not really have that, that, that uh, confidence, you know. Yeah. Uh, oh. I think one of the things also we also notice is that the Banjas, because they're so small in numbers, they tend to uh, marry outside of the Banja community. So there's a lot of mixed marriages. Um, so just now, uh, someone highlighted in the question that you, you shared the Salasila. The third, fourth generation probably are not, you know, 100% Banja. Probably yeah. the Champu Arab, the Champu Bayu, and all that, Champu Bugis, and all that. Would you still consider them Banjaris? And also, how would you um, pass on this Banjaris identity towards the next generation? I think through food. I'm, I'm asking your personal plan here. Okay. No, I think we, <laughs> we can start with, I think, uh, promoting our own traditional <laughs> cuisine. <laughs> you know? yeah. I think cuisine, I think makan is, the most, is always the best. Okay, the fact that we did not bring in the, the, you know, the rest of the culture, like dance and all that, food is definitely in our blood. Ah, in my house is soto banja, lepat banja, but then you know it's never been a business for us. But you know when 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 uh, our our guests of honor that they during the launch, so where can we get this in our house? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, of course we do have relatives who have already started that. So and Marcelina, you know what? Yes, this is one area. So my niece in KL is very interested in the cuisine part of the banja culture. Uh, still with dance and all that, there's just no interest. But are the, are the younger generation, like your nieces and nephews, are they aware of their Banja yes, heritage? Yes, we make it a point and we do talk. So it depends on their parents as well. Mm -hmm. um, I make it a point to do that, right? So like my, my brother's children in, in KL, uh, they're very aware. I, it tends to be the, f the female who are more, I don't know, ladies tend to be more interested. Mm. But only the, the foods are only known by the Banjaris. But among the... Other races are like the, 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 the Japanese, mm. or the, they, they are not aware of the really this uh, Banjaris food. No? Like, mm. banjar. If I ask them to know, have you tasted? I, don't, I never tasted Lapat Banja, you know, uh, or Talam Banja so or something like that, or Soto Banja even. Mm. Uh, so if you can, you know, uh, kind of, uh, this, is, this is business, no? mm. but whether you then to, 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 to project this uh, kind of food eh, to, to other people, so. Every Singaporean, they, they, they know what is Lepak Banja, what is, uh, you know, Talam Banja, Soto mm -hmm. Banja. Uh, uh. No, I think uh, we have two programs uh, related to cuisine as part of the festival. Um, but I think that's for another time. And also just to share with, with uh, everyone, you probably already had Banjari's food, you just didn't know it's Banjari's food. Uh, most kuehs that is labelled Pranakan have Banjari's origins. Uh, go to the exhibition, we will point which ones are which. Uh, okay, uh, we've come towards the end of the... Uh, forum. Uh, thank you for your questions, uh, if you're here or if you're at home. Uh, thank you, ladies. Thank you, gentlemen, for, for sharing um, your, your uh, stories and histories with us. Um, I would like to seek your input. Uh, we have this other QR code. This is for feedback. Uh, so if you have any feedback on this 
a particular forum, uh, and if you have any input questions or whatever that you would like us to respond to, you can send it to here. Um, we will have two more uh, forums similar to this with representatives from the Bangladesh community. We're going to talk about uh, more into uh, the the living live culture, the, the language, uh, the, the songs, maybe lullabies, uh, what it means to grow up Banja in Singapore uh, when your community is so small and you are always mingling with other people. And we also will have another forum. Uh, this one is specific to Banjari's language. Uh, Banjari's language is one of the identifiers of Banjari's culture, uh, as well as your Baju Sasirangan. Wow, always Sasirangan, except you. So we're going to be sh listening, hearing uh, more stories from the community members uh, and also what their plans are to continue promoting uh, Banjari's culture, language, heritage uh, moving forward for the future generation. Right? Um, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, if you've not seen the exhibition, please do check it out. Uh, all these people here and some in the crowd have worked very hard for the special exhibition. Um, if you are following us on uh, Facebook, you will get latest updates on our upcoming programs. Uh, today, actually tomorrow is the last day of uh, Malay Culture Fest. This year is um, the only, the first time we, we're doing a digital festival. So all of the programs in the past few weeks are available on our microsite. It is at uh, www.malayheritage.mcf2020. Right? So if you've missed the past lectures, if you've missed the past performances and all that, they are all available on the microsite. They are also available on our YouTube channel as well as uh, our Facebook. Um, okay, uh, that's it for now. Thank you again for being with us and um, have a good weekend. Assalamualaikum. <laughs>